Wow, what's up everybody? Once again, it's Brand Man Sean, and as you can see, I have a very special guest for you guys. I can't wait to introduce you to this guy. He is a staff writer currently at Elevator Magazine, but he's written for publications such as Revolt Media and TV. Um, he's been writing for a while. We're going to go through not only the struggles of being a writer and just what that looks like in general for someone who might want to be a writer, but also just how do writers look at content, right? And I know a lot of you guys are trying to get your content written about, so there'll be a lot of value for that uh, with you guys. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Armand Sattler. What's up, Armand? Hello, man. Sean, thanks so much for having me. It's great to, um, first of all, your platform is awesome. Um, and it's great that someone you know, thinks my opinion is worth having on this platform. So looking forward to the conversation and hopefully I can inspire someone who wants to be a writer or get into the music industry. Hey, for sure, for sure, man. So what, just to jump right into it, man. First of all, what made you want to be a writer? Yeah, sure. So it actually was a very random uh, happening. So I was looking for internships in the summer of my sophomore year of college. I went to Cornell. So there was a lot of pressure to find that investment banking internship or that big one where you can live in New York City and do all this fun stuff. But you know, me, that was that was never really the path I wanted to go. I was always a very creative person. I came into college and wanted to be a sports broadcaster at ESPN. So I was looking into internships pertaining to that. Didn't really work out. Um, so a couple months before the semester ended, my mom connected me with, um, one of my cousins who worked at a place called musictimes.com in New York city, nice. um, went for an interview, was able to talk to her a bit, kind of figure out what they were doing and what I would be doing, uh, at the company as an intern. And yeah, started there. It was really cool, uh, being in an office. Uh, where people are just listening to music, talking about music, interviewing artists, like everything was music related. And I had such a strong love for music throughout my life. Uh, sang in the church choir, would rap for fun with my cousins, like, you know, just stuff that like everyone does. But I never really thought of it being a career that I would want to pursue. And I didn't know what my specific role would look like. So being there and, you know, as an intern, you do the typical making copies, getting coffee, stuff like that. But they really gave me a lot of cool opportunities uh, to write questions for, for interviews, um, to uh, post my own articles. I was published for the first time in the summer of 2015. I wrote an article. It was, it was sports articles because they would do sports and music. But just being around those people, being around people who wrote for like so some of them were writing for 10 years and they just had such, such a wealth of knowledge to share with me. Um, and I was like, you know, like this is, I, I really enjoyed um, my summer here and I've always enjoyed writing. Uh, I would in college or high school when I was writing essays, like those were the types of things I look forward to. I hated exams. I like <laughs> presentations for public speaking, but when it came to essays, like just sitting down and just putting all your ideas on paper, like that's an art and, and that's a skill. And that's something that I, I took a lot of pride in. Got you. So, so one second, Matt, one second. So you basically didn't even want to get into music. You knew you want to do some writing of some sort. You didn't want to run, do that VC investment banking like so many uh, of Cornell people I do know do. Right. But the music kind of happened haphazardly. You were, you were in this position and you said, oh man, this is nice. Right? Mm -hmm. exactly. Okay. It. But yeah. That's cool. So once you made that career direction or that career choice, as far as being in a writer, what was that struggle to be uh, like? Because I know you can work one place, but so many of the writers I know write for multiple places at one time. Explain why that is. Yeah. So it was, it was very tough for me to figure out, like, you know, I obviously had the people at the internship who I worked with previously, but in terms of people who were really close to me, who I spoke with every day, like all of my friends and colleagues and fraternity brothers, they would all be doing, you know, those typical careers like law or finance. So I was really doing a lot of it on my own in terms of networking, in terms of learning stuff. And then you actually have to know what you're talking about in terms of music. Like I see so many articles where, you know, people are giving their opinions on things, but they're not necessarily covering everything that's pertinent. Like, you know, what has the artist done lately? Um, what's coming out for them? How, what, what, what were the reactions like to their previous music? Like, there's just a lot of things that you need to include in these type of articles. And, you know, I got some of that experience at Music Times, 
but a lot of it I had to learn on my own. Uh, so I actually ended up writing for uh, a startup called Hand Me the Ox back in 2016 uh, okay. that that one of my colleagues uh, at Cornell, colleague Peter, I don't know the proper word, um, he was involved with it, so, so, so he set me up. And I was really happy there. I didn't recognize then that to really get my name out there and to really land some dope opportunities, like I needed to be putting out consistent content, but I also needed to network. I, I got very complacent writing for Ham of the Ox. It was a fun group. They gave me a lot of creative freedom. They gave that I, I could write about literally anything. I could the, it, it could be the longest article. It could be the shortest article. So I got really comfortable there. But it t- it took me summer 2016 when I saw one of my friends working for four different publications and how how much how she was doing amazing things, interviewing people, going to events, everything that I, I would have loved to do, but I just yeah. didn't know how, how to go about it. So upon speaking with her, and I can't stress it enough, networking and using people who you know, who who do what you do, and don't use them. Like, obviously, build that genuine relationship, take an interest in what they're doing, do your research, but the the people closest to you who are your age, and this person's actually a year younger than me, so so I I felt behind looking at what she was (laughs) But fortunately, she, she was a really helpful person. She gave me a lot of insight about how to network, going to literally go, going to events just going up to people and talking to them and and not being afraid to tell them what you do like it's not bragging you, you yeah. you're just sharing information that that could ultimately help someone else so yeah uh and in terms of writing for multiple publications that it's, it's just a really good way to get your name out there and also to get a very different experience hand me the ox because it was a startup i had a lot of creative freedom Working at the Source magazine in the summer of 2017, I was basically told what to write. And most of it I was interested in because it was hip hop, but I do like, you know, the opportunity to kind of come up with my own things and put them on paper and find my own specific angles. Um, And then my my most recent position uh, as a staff writer at at, uh, at Elevator, I also get that creative freedom. It's, It's a balance. I get the creative freedom, but then there are things thrown my way. So it just gives you a more diverse experience and and you're really able to determine what you want to do, whether you want to be somewhere that's a startup that's growing or you want to go to a super established magazine like the like the source magazine and kind of just be a part of it, even though you're not necessarily affecting change there. So it's all about personal preference. But, you know, writing for multiple publications gives you that opportunity to really test the waters in a lot of different areas. So as you started to get your experience in the game, what have you decided in terms of the route that you want to go? Do you want to be a more so well-known writer, like household name? Um, Are you just happy working for publications and getting a decent income, uh, good income? Maybe you work your way up to be an editor or something one day, but it's not necessarily brand-based outside of the immediate industry, right? You have those writers who are known by the general public and you have those writers who are known well within the industry and just do what they do and keep moving. Yeah, so for me, one of the most important things for me in my life is having options. I want the option to pursue being an editor. I want the option to say, okay, I've written enough. Now I want to pursue being a manager or an A&R at a label. Mm, My love for music has driven me to open myself up to a lot of different possibilities. When I first started writing A Hand of the Ox, it was fun. Like I said, I got very complacent. But then I realized that, you know, I wasn't necessarily getting the exposure that I wanted. So I took a chance, applied to the source, got that role. Now my articles are going out to millions of people daily. Um, That's really awesome. And, you know, again, being able to write for multiple publications allows your name to stretch across various different networks. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, if if things go a certain way and I happen to become uh, a, 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 a editor at a publication, that would be awesome. If I happen to, you know, write for a long time and connect with certain artists and then and then and then become an a and r or a manager somewhere that would be awesome i i tell people a lot of the time that i don't want to be a writer forever um there's it's it's it definitely doesn't pay the best and you know for me because music is my passion i'm i'm okay with that but i am looking to make money eventually Speaking so, of payment, like what does pay typically look like um for a writer when when we talk about freelance then we yeah. talk about being a staff writer. 
-hmm. and any other variations? What are the primary variations you've experienced? It depends one, like you said, whether it's whether you're on staff or, or you're freelance, then it depends also on the on the publication that, that you're working for. If it's a big one like uh, the source or complex or genius, then you're more than likely going to be paid whether you're on staff or you're freelancing freelance. You get paid per article staff. Yeah, this is like a flat rate typically. Um, so and then, all, yeah, yeah, it depends on where your company's at. Hand me the ox. I started there in 2016. It started a month before I joined. So I haven't gotten paid anything for it, but because I get along so well with everyone who works there and because I've just enjoyed the experience and it's helped me become a much better writer in these last three years, I'm completely okay with that. And I'm happy well, like, getting money from them when it comes, but that's not something I'm concerned about with Hand Me The Hawks. When it comes to, you know, these bigger roles that I have and, you know, cause I'm out going to events and networking and, uh, you know, connecting with artists so I can uh, secure exclusive premieres for us then, you know, I, I, I would like to be paid, you know, what I'm worth. And that's something that I learned from Joe Budden. I learned it from a lot of different people. You know, you have to know your value. And I think people have this habit of, of being too loyal to places and investing in the long term and also not really seeing their value. You have to know, really know your value. And, and when you know it, take it with you everywhere you go and make sure that people recognize that. I really enjoy my current role. At, at Elevator because me and my editor, we talk every day. He shows me a lot of appreciation for the topics I come up with. Um, I, I try to put out, you know, as, as many articles as possible. I'm staying in tune with music culture and throwing different ideas on how to make the publication better. So for me, I see it as a long-term investment and as much as I would like money right now, I know that it's gonna come because I'm, I'm doing things actively to help the brand become bigger. Got it. So what does that look like in terms of your personal brand though, right? Because you say you want options and there's two major types of branding when it comes to this, right? There's once again, that industry branding and then the, the wider public. Have you started to focus on your branding of yourself as, an, as a, um, a writer, where it's not just the people you happen to be working with that know your name, but you start to integrate into the other people who just happen to be peeping within the industry? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm constantly attending different networking events in, uh, in uh, New York City, just advertising myself. You know, I, I, it's interesting, too, because I usually try to not come out immediately with who I write for, mm -hmm. because, you know, certain people, the, the, they'll only speak to you if they think that they can get something out of you. So oh, yeah. if, if I come from the beginning, like, oh, I write for Elevator and Revolt, then obviously, like, someone who's an artist trying to get a premiere is going to be like, oh, word, you know, like, I love them, blah, 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 this, that, and the third, and it might not be, be genuine. Mm -hmm. So I, I just tell people that I, I'm a writer, I've got a passionate passion for music, I tell them how long I've done it, and then I usually try to throw out, like, a topic pertaining to music, like, oh, did you check out this album, or oh, what do you think about this beef? And just, you know, talk with people, and I, I, I gain knowledge from them. And I'm also able to give them my own knowledge. And then, you know, we can get into, oh, these are the publications that, that, that I write for, this, that, and the third. But, you know, for me, at the end of the day, like, I, I would rather people recognize me for me rather than who I'm associated with, just in case they're only looking to get something out of who I'm associated with. And I also try to show my knowledge. And I don't know all there is to know about music. There are classic yeah. albums that I need to revisit. There are albums that have come out more recently that... I need to revisit, but I try to really stay in tune and stay in the know so I can have these conversations with people and and, and they can be impressed by, you know, someone who's very well read and, and, and researches. And then I can come out with, oh, by the way, this is who I write for. So like, you can check out my content there. Yeah. And then it gives it some, some, uh, some, I don't really know the proper word there, but it, it just makes it more like realistic, I guess. I feel you. And who are like, what are the top projects? in your mind right now that, that have come out this year so far, I would be interested to know which ones that have really resonated with you specifically. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a tough question. I think about it every day because there's so much music coming out now that you can't really sit with an album for a week because there's something coming the following week, unless it's one of your favorite artists. Yeah. So I would say number one this year is Astro World, Travis Scott. Uh, still haven't skipped a song there, phenomenal production. Uh, great features the fact that he didn't list the features that was an amazing first listen because you just see the song titles and you're like oh frank ocean oh drake sway lee like it's like wow this is 
like Travis really put a lot of effort into this, but he also, he didn't want people to look at the track list, look for their favorite artists and just listen to those songs. He made it a very holistic experience. So Astro World one, Scorpion by Drake number two. Drake is my favorite rapper. I'm, I'm not gonna hide that. Wow. Um, there was a lot riding on this album with the Pusha T beef and just I, I, with the point he's at in, 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 in his career. Like he's almost, he's succeeded so much that he set the bar too high for himself. But I feel like Scorpion was the best album he's put out since Take Care. And I I would venture to say it might be better than Take Care, but that's just me and that's a whole other <laughs> conversation. Yeah, that's heavy. That's heavy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> number three, Pusha T, Daytona. You know, people were complaining that the seven song albums weren't going to be long enough, but that was absolutely more than enough. It was... It was short, but it was every song was impactful. Kanye killed the production on that. The the features were, were very strategic. Even Kanye with his poop scoop nonsense, like it it, it worked. It, it was it was catchy. It, it was funny. I you know, and Kanye is a whole other conversation that we can get into because I don't want people thinking that you know I'm I'm a supporter of everything. But his his production and his verse on uh what, what would Meek do? Very solid on that album. Yeah. Number four. I would probably go J Rock Redemption. Um, you know, I've I've been very aware of yeah. TDE. Obviously, Kendrick is the biggest name there, but J Rock was actually in TDE before Kendrick, and Kendrick was like his hype man, people say. Um, but Kendrick kind of took that platform. Like he's he's the biggest name out of TDE. But J Rock, great lyricist. Uh, he he has one of the verses of the year on uh, King's Dead, so I'm glad to see that he put that on yeah. on his album. The uh, rotation 112th, uh, the wow freestyle, out of sight, out of mind with J. Cole. Like, he's got, he, he's definitely got a collection of hits, but, but there's a narrative there. And it's, you know, it, it's one of those albums you can feel. Like, it's, it, it's not for casual listening. You sit, you listen to it, it makes you think, but you also feel a lot more connected to him. Yeah. Number five is tough. Uh, if we're going just rap albums, then I would go KOD by Cole. But if we're going rap and R&B or just all-inclusive genres, I got to go East Atlanta Love Letter by Black. That album, it... Let's it, go with that Black. <laughs> it, it, me. I, I listened to that on, on on my flight home from, uh, I think, Miami. And, you know, just, you're on a flight, you're just sitting there, you got nothing else to do, so you really can sit with music and listen to it. And he's one of the best right now at both singing and rapping. You know, it, I believe it was a 15, 14, 15 song project. He only had four features, but the ones he had were very well picked. Future did great. Offset's verse was great. Cole's verse on Pretty Little Fears, another verse of the year. He, even, you know, the, the song with Khalid, and that's towards my bottom on the album. But, you know, Black made something that, again, it's another album you can really feel. Um, and, and it was definitely a turn from his first album, Free Black. That was very dark. And very, you know, it, it just felt very, he was kind of in that mysterious phase of his life. And East Atlanta Love Letter, it feels like he's more breaking into the, you know, this is who I am. People really getting to know me. I'm, I'm kind of mainstream, but I'm also one of the best at what I'm doing. That like, I, I felt like he was making a statement towards all these guys who are trying to do the trap R&B. Like he really, he really put together a great work. I, I listen to that so often. Yeah, Black is something special, man. I think what's going to happen with him I mean, he, I like I love the way he carries himself, and he's really strategic about being how who he is, but how he expresses that publicly through his brand. But I think the um, time I don't know if you know about the time he had with Flo Rider, and like writing all these pop hits. Mm -hmm. If you compare and take heed of his battleground day, battle rap days, and then couple that with writing pop songs for people like Flo Rider, and then mesh that type of knowledge from those extremes into what he's doing, I think he's going to have a lot of lasting power, man. And just yeah. create great content that's not necessarily pop, but still has that level of appeal. Like, he's he's killing it, man. He's, he's very versatile. And that's that's what it's all about nowadays. You know, people come into the industry, they get caught up in the auto-tune, they get caught up in the trap beats, but he can he can really do it all. And that's how you that's how you establish staying power. That's what's up. Um, when you talk about artists, now I've heard you mention your top um, projects. What do you look for when it comes to the writer, the, the up and coming artists that you write about? Yeah, so, um, you know, given that 
there is a certain culture of music these days, you know, the mainstream culture, people call it bubblegum rap or pop rap, where everyone's using auto-tune, everyone's doing these trap beats with 808s and stuff like that. And I like that. That's the type of stuff that I like to turn up to, or if I'm getting ready for a sporting event back in the day when I played sports, then, you know, that's the type of stuff that I would listen to. When it comes to these publications and, and artists who I personally like to write about, it's all about the story. It's all about where you came from, your work ethic, what you, you know, promote through your music, and just really, you, you know, your full package. Like, so someone can make a really good song. There are a lot of people who make really good songs. Right. But there are people who don't, you don't necessarily feel engaged to them. So you don't necessarily feel that, that need to continually check out their content and do research on them and follow them on social media. So... And, and that's, those are things that I take into account. Like if, if artists put their social media in their emails when they send me stuff, I, I look at that too. You know, I, I look to see what types of, what they're really putting out, what they want people to see. You know, music is a shared experience and it's beyond, you know, the beats and the lyrics. It's, you know, you, you can really put yourself out there. People can really get a sense of, of who you are. So, you know, when, when I skim through all of the submissions I get, and it's, it's a lot and it's, it's tough to keep up with. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's 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 very very tough but, but you know I'm, just, I'm really oh go ahead sorry now, do people just randomly like i don't submit to you through elevator or these other publications and you're filtering that way or are these people you just meet on the street and you give them the, you you give them your info and then they hit you up yeah no it's, it's a lot of different ways i mean there are people who find my email address i don't know how they do it but they somehow find my email address and send me stuff and i'm i'm impressed by by, by tenacity and doing your research so like that's cool like if someone who i've never heard of never met finds my email and sends me something i'll listen to it because like you, you took the time out to find me specifically which also it kind of strokes my ego a little bit but that's besides the point um but um yeah so that that you know they send submissions through elevator and then my editor might show it to me um you know again at these networking events i do meet people but that's that, that's always the most that's always a very interesting thing for me again that's another reason that I like to not tell people who who I write for immediately because you know certain people would just come up to you and hand you their card be like oh oh you write for this like listen to my stuff check out my social media if we don't have a conversation you just hand me a card and you know tell me to follow a link like chances are I'm not going to do it un, un, unless you happen to be performing that night and like I see you do do a show live and you kill it I'm I'm probably not going to like hold on to that card and go home and be like, Oh, I need to check this out. But if someone comes up to me, they genuinely want to get to know me. We have a conversation. We just, you know, we kick it and we talk about anything. And then it, it I, I like, it comes up where I work for. And then it comes up that, 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 that they do music. They want me to listen to. I'm, I'm more inclined. I'm, I'm all about the engagement. And right. I'm about you know, building a genuine relationship with people. Got you. Have you ever reached out to artists? Like you just, you know, you're seeing some music out there or you're out on the social landscape and next thing you know, you say, yo, who is this? Or you, and you reach out to them, write, out, write about them, or you just write an impromptu article, you know, under your own volition. Absolutely, yeah. No, there, uh, there have been tons of artists recently who I've, who I've been reaching out to. Um, and I like to apply the whole shoot your shot thing that people use with uh, men and women and dating. Like, I use yeah. that professionally. Like, if I'm writing an article about an artist and maybe he's not that popping yet, so I don't know, I can't find stuff about him through Google or whatever, then I'll shoot him a DM like, hey man, I'm, I'm, I'm about to do a cover on you. I really liked your verse on this. Can you just tell me you know, where you're from and some details and, and uh, anything else that you're coming out with lately? And artists who, who, who are up and coming and who wanna be on, on these platforms, they'll, they'll absolutely respond. Like they, they look for stuff like that. Like that's one of the most, tough things as a creator, which I'm sure you, uh, you, you can understand, even though you've gotten to where you are and you're doing phenomenal. Like when you first start out, you're very sensitive and you're kind of insecure about your content. You know, if, if, if it's not really getting the engagement that you want. Got it. So, you know, for me, if, if I was, if I was an artist and someone DM me saying, Hey, I'm about to write an article on you. I want to know this. Like that would be the most exciting thing ever. Cause one, yeah. they heard my stuff. Two, they heard it and they liked it enough to the point where they want to write about it. And three, they have the courage to contact me and, and, and build that relationship. So, you know, there, there was one artist I wrote about. He's from Cali. Uh, really great guy. And, like, we've, we've been keeping in touch since then. And, like, whenever he has new stuff, he sends it to me. So that, that gives me an opportunity to have more content to write about. 
and and it, you know it, his name is showing up more consistently so he's able to build more of a following and it, it works to both of our benefits and that's what it's all about you know building these relationships with artists and within this industry you, you have to have something to offer like people aren't always looking to just do things for you and and invest in you without anything coming out of their investment so i always try to make sure there's a mutual benefit so that sounds great and but pretend i'm an artist right and i know every single writer they kind of have their own taste right everybody has their own taste it's, it's not one magic bullet but what are some of the things let's talk about a specific artist scenario or maybe a few artists that you came across and you really are supporting them and they don't really have a strong following they might have five thousand followers on Instagram. I don't know, but you know, somebody who would, you would consider is pretty early on and don't, and they don't have the momentum where you could say, Hey, I'm just hopping on the boom. I'm hopping on the bandwagon, but I'm all more so kind of might be one of those people who actually break this artist because I'm one of the first people to present them to the world. Are there a few artists like that, that you written about? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, being living in New Jersey and being in New York all the time, there are plenty of artists who I've met uh, that I'm like, wow, you're talented. You should be known. I'm like, well, why don't people know you yet? And having this opportunity and this platform as a writer, I'm able to share advice and share insight, you know, like the story of Brockhampton and how, the, you know, they kind of built their own independent following through social media. That's really inspiring. And that's something that I continually bring up when I speak to artists like this. Like nowadays, it's not just about having a good sound anymore. And it's not just about your story. It's, it's how you utilize social media and how you brand yourself. So if an artist isn't using, you know, uh, using their, their Twitter or their Instagram properly. I'm like, hey, you should make it your Instagram, uh, 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 you should make it a uh, business profile. And right. you should be putting sponsored ads for you know whatever content you're putting out. And you should target specific regions because cool. you, know, you kind of build out regionally before you build out nationally. Or, hey, you know, like you, you, your song's good, um, but maybe you should try this or maybe you should add some background vocals, you know. Um, I've had the opportunities to be in studios with with some of these artists as well. So it, it just gives me more more tangible knowledge that that, that I can then share with other artists because that's that's all I want. Like, I, I, I want to be able to really help people understand that this isn't, you know, a lot of people discourage pursuing music, whether it's as an artist or as a writer. They say, oh, it's not realistic. Not everyone's going to make it. I want people to feel like this is something tangible for them. I, I want them to chase their dream because it's their dream and not feel like they're, you know, they're missing out or they go, right. they're going up life the wrong way. You no, know but just to clarify who, but who are some of these artists though? I'm asking specifically, like, give me a couple of names and maybe what those artists, like what you saw in those artists when you looked into them and said, wow, this is somebody I want to write about. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, there is one artist by the name of Nicholas Early. He's uh, originally from Covina, California. Um, he currently resides in Harlem. He's an R&B soul guy. He just dropped an EP back in August called For Everything I've Done. Um, very, very beautiful voice. Uh, it's, it's one of the most just naturally raw. It's like he... He, he sounds like one of those R&B tracks from like the 80s, like the, the, the way his voice, it's like, it's like soothing, but it's, it's like powerful at the same time. And, you know, but there's a difference between singing well and being able to put together uh, good songs. And he, he's, he's my age, 23 now. He's been writing since he was 15 years old, getting in studios, working on vocals, connecting with, with producers. Um, but, you know, he was a full-time student and, that, and then he was working full-time in New York. So he wasn't able to put all of his time into, into his craft. I, I firmly believe if he was doing music 24-7, he would he, he he he'd be popping by like the end of this year. I think he's popping. I think he's very talented. Hmm. But you know the, the the social media following and all of that might not reflect it. And it takes time. Like this isn't something that you do and you just become uh, popping from the get. So that's one person. As uh, another artist uh, by the name of Kush Dot Wave uh, Wave without an E, so just W A V. Um, he's a he's a rapper. Um, very strong auto tune use, but but he has really nice vocals as well. Comes up with some very catchy hooks, and um, I, I think he has a really great sound. Uh, same thing with him. Uh, he's just got to work on his branding a little more, um, and and I, I think that he'll be great personally. And then there's another artist by the name of Jacques Lane. Uh, he's another New York rapper. Uh, he's been he's also been doing this music stuff since he was like 
15. He just dropped an album back in April, and then he, he ended up going on tour with uh, Kaz from from, from Dreamville. Wow. Uh, he, he went for him in like DC, Philly. I think he, he did a show out in Oakland as well. Um, so he's he, he's definitely a little further along the, than Nick and Kush, but um, you know it still just takes takes branding. Um, it takes you know really putting yourself out there, consistent content, and you know consistent content is tough because you have to strategize. You don't want to oversaturate, but at the same time, uh, Russ talked about this in one of his interviews. One month in the music industry is like one year, so people don't hear yeah. from you for like one month. It's very easy to forget about you. So. It's really hard to sat- oversaturate the market these days. People have so many choices. They're consuming so much content. It, yeah. it's, it's hard. It's easier to be forgotten, a lot easier to, to be forgotten than put up too much music. You put out a lot of music, they'll choose whatever they like, and then they'll keep listening to that. Um, I um looked up Kush.Wave, right? So I see he has 260 followers on Instagram. So you're supporting him. He, he's super early on, but you, you mess with his music. Have you written about him already? Not yet, not yet. Uh, he is, he's in the process of, um, of, you know, making more songs and then he's kind of going to strategize which single he wants to drop first. Um, so so I, I've been speaking with him about his plan because he really wants to take his time and make sure he goes about it right. Um, so with him, you know, I'm, I'm kind of just waiting it out, letting him figure out his artistic process, figure out what songs he really likes. And then once that single drops, I'll, I'll have something on him. Uh, Nick, I wrote about, on uh, hey, Hammy the Ox, uh, but back when his EP dropped, and then he, when he dropped his single a couple months prior to then, and then uh, Jacques actually he has a single dropping on uh, my job now at, at uh, Elevator. It drops in about an hour and twenty five minutes. Um, so it was really exciting for me to be able to put him on my platform uh, and get him some more exposure. So yeah, you know it's it's I I, I kind of try to work with the artists. And, you know, if because Kush has songs out, but he, he, he really has a lot of faith in the content that's coming. So I'm kind of waiting on him to be, you know, fully ready to like hit the ground running and put out stuff. And then from there, I'll give a bit more coverage. Dope. So the way this relationship works in general, like, if it, so let me see, how can I say this? So a safe way to just speak in general, not necessarily just your relationship with artists, but if you feel like the writer artist relationship happens to go like this, would it be safe to say it's, you might meet an artist just because you meet them and you like them doesn't mean you're going to write about them immediately, but there's an ongoing relationship. You're learning more about them over time. And then one day you might, you might write an article. You might never write an article about them depending on what they're doing, but it's really just you reading. I mean, getting introduced to the artist, however you get introduced to them. And then you kind of watch them until you feel like you're ready to write an article or maybe they might say hey i got this coming out and then you feel like hey well i can trust this artist i, I believe in what they're doing and i might support is that right yeah absolutely it's it's all about the relationship it's all about the timing there are people like there are a couple names who whenever i see them show up in in my email i kind of cringe a bit because i'm like all they're doing is just sending me stuff. Like I've, I've, I've never, we've never really just engaged. Like they, they just, they literally would just send me like a press release for a song and, and a description and the actual song. And I'm like, after months, do you not, do you not recognize that maybe there's a different way that you can go about this? So, you know, me personally, I, I really do. I can't stress enough. I really do value people having that genuine engagement because the music industry is a dog eat dog world and people will do whatever it is do whatever they can to get ahead and take advantage of people. So, you know, I, I, I try to keep, keep, keep my morals a priority, keep, you know, and just operate in a certain way that I'm, I'm genuine. I don't, I don't mislead people. I don't say, Oh, I got you with the feature. And then it never happens. Like I always follow up on my stuff, but I, I have to see that you're consistent in what you do as well. And, and you really value, the relationship not just what i can do for you yeah hey man that sun's hitting you real hard right about now <laughs> um so with that being said what's the best way for an artist to get in contact with the writer outside of sending emails let's say i'm sending these cold emails how would i go about developing a better relationship what's a better approach as opposed to just sending a 
press kit and five songs. Listen to my album. It hasn't even released yet, as if somebody's supposed to care that you're giving them an early preview exclusive to something that they don't even know about. Because a lot of artists <laughs> feel like, make it seem like they're doing you a favor. And I know that for a fact on the other end, it's like, no, man, you're kind of intruding. Please approach me differently. So what's the best way, at least you would like to be approached? Me personally, I'm always on social media. I'm always on Twitter, Instagram. Um, so that's the easiest way to reach me because I'm using them the most. That's where I get my news on music. That's where I, you know, joke about Nicki Minaj and how she's bugging out with Cardi. Like that, that's just where I do a lot of my music consumption and music discussion. So it's very easy to get in touch with me there. Um, you know, it's it's also for me again. Well, it's your social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my Instagram is just my name, uh, Armand Sadler. And then my Twitter is Armizzle, A-R-M-I-Z-Z-L-E with an underscore. Yeah. Uh, I'd say those are really the only ones. I mean, if you want to find me on Facebook, it's just my name as well. But um, yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's always impressive when I see people did their research. So uh, this one guy DM me, he was like, hey, man, you know, I saw, I see what you do with Hammy the Ox. You know, I, I loved your articles, especially this one. And then I see you moved on to the source and revolt. You know, it shows that they actually like, you know, because I, I, I have all my stuff in my bio on Twitter and Instagram. So, but if, if you can, you know, name something specific that I've done for a specific publication, like, uh, the article I did on on the art of incomplete songs or the article I did on the element of surprise in music, if you can actually cite something specific from that, that's really impressive to me. That shows me that, you know, again, you're not just looking to get something out of me, but you you took the time to take an interest in what I do. And then you also shot your shot professionally and, and hit me up on social media and put yourself out there. Like that's that's really bold. It's tough. And, you know, people are always on Twitter underneath uh, celebrities tweets putting their SoundCloud link and stuff like that's cool it's a way to get exposure if you're kind of going off of a celebrities tweet but if you're it's all about it's all about the direct in interaction with people like that's really where you feel the most connected so that I, I would say social media taking an interest in what I did and, and that's a lesson for all of networking not just for for writers that's for if you're trying to be if you're trying to work at Goldman Sachs and and you happen to meet the, the VP of whatever, like if you go through their LinkedIn and research them and you can like talk to them about what they do and then also provide them some information that, that they don't have or send them a cool article, that's, that's a really good way to get over and to build rapport and ultimately lead to a conversation that could get you somewhere. So exactly. I think that's extremely valuable. I actually wrote something called a master music networking guide. And I go over a lot of those things very specifically that you just said, because it's really about being professional and it's really about showing that this is not some random message. You can't just spam everybody. You have to sh show that I chose you to speak, like to, to reach out to, because I saw value in you in particular. Right. Well, like if you, if you can't do it as an artist, then at least figure out how to fake in some sorts that you chose that person, right? It, it, yeah. It's hard to get out there. I know you're just trying to figure out that one person that could put you on, but I think it'll make it a lot easier when you don't look at these writers or these people as that one person that'll put you on because usually it's not anyway. You know, yeah. you're, it's just a building a, a, a network of people and eventually that snowballs and now your network that you built might put you on as a whole, but it's never going to be just one contact. Exactly. Exactly. Um, are there any, well, just let me hear a little bit more about what your day to day is as a writer, like this is more for the writers, people who want to be in your position. What's your day to day since you decided, hey, I'm not going to just be with Pass the Ox. I'm going to be writing in multiple um, publications because I'm trying to develop this brand, develop my name and my reach. What is now? What does that look like since you're in that position? Yeah, it's tough. So, um, so Elevator is based out of Chicago. So I actually work from home, which is awesome. Uh, a lot of freedom. I can wake up when I want to. I can do really what I want to, but too much freedom is kind of a curse because, you know, there's no structure. So yeah. I try to build a uh, structure for myself. So I wake up, you know, I'll check my phone immediately. Um, I'll check Twitter, see if anything crazy happened in music while I was asleep. Um, I'll check yeah. Instagram, I'll check certain artists, social media. Um, and then from there, I try to watch 
or listen to specific podcasts. Rap Radar on title with uh, with uh, a- a- Elliot Wilson, really dope. Really dope. great music mind. He talks to a lot of great people. Joe Budden podcast, I religiously watch that every every Wednesday. Well, I listen every Wednesday, and then it comes out on YouTube like two days later. But yeah. it's, it's every Wednesday and every Saturday on Spotify, so I listen to that. Um, I watch Everyday Struggle on Complex, not necessarily because I like academics and, and and his journalistic abilities but they always talk about certain relevant topics and they also provide some really interesting perspectives so it, it gives me the opportunity to get a diversity of opinion because joe budden can be very opinionated yeah um, <laughs> very opinionated and then the uh the uh title podcast it's really just an opportunity for the artist to talk and there's a lot of value in hearing from the artists but um and then everyday struggle is kind of like it's a lot of trolling. It's a lot of humor. So you, you get to hear about a lot of different things in, in various different ways. So I watch those. And then I, I check out new music that's come out that I'm interested in, obviously the big releases. But then I'll, I'll also just skim through Apple Music and check on some artists whose names I've never seen before and listen to that and see if I can find, you know, certain gems. Dope. So from there, I decide uh, if it's worth writing about for me personally and which publication the, that I want to write for. Hand me, uh, certain stories I feel are, are, are better for Hand Me the Ox, certain stuff I feel is better for Elevator. For Elevator, we really focus on uh, up and coming artists and kind of giving them that platform. So a lot of these, uh, these up and comers I'll, I'll, do, I'll do for Elevator. And then Hand Me the Ox um, is where, you know, because it's a startup and because I get so much freedom there, I, I, I don't feel constrained to the to how writing needs to be for Elevator and big publications. So I can really say whatever I want for Hand Me the Ox. So there, I'll, I'll do some more think pieces. I'll, I'll do some more clever and creative articles. And I've done some of them for Elevator as well. So that's, that's one struggle I have is kind of deciding which content goes where because it, it can really be good for either one. But Elevator has a much bigger platform than Hand Me the Ox. Have so, you ever had a uh, publication get upset that you put it, an article one place as opposed to another place? No, never. It's interesting, actually. Like, that's one thing I have to, uh, I, I show love to Hand of the Ox so often because I, I started for them in April of 2016. I'm still writing for them now. And as a result of working with them, they're great music minds. They all listen to so many different things. So they really opened my, my mind up to more, more genres. And they've also challenged me and made me better at expressing my opinion and you know people just will throw things out but they don't explain like that's it's like it's one of the most interesting things to me like people will throw points out but they don't really get deep into them so that yeah. that platform yeah. Jimmy the Ox has has afforded me the opportunity to be challenged and and to kind of feel like damn I, I, I didn't say that the right way so it's made me a better writer and and they also support me and my personal ventures um, very much like the, the, I had a conversation with the owner of Hammy the Ox recently. I was like, man, I'm sorry. Like it was, it was a quiet month for me. You know, I've been working really hard with these other publications. He was like, I don't understand why you're apologizing for that. Like, that's what we want for you guys. We want you guys to do what you want to do and to be successful in whatever way you want to be successful. Because at, at the end of the day, it just reflects positively back on us. Like we had this writer, he wrote for us for two years and then he got a gig at the source and then revolt and then elevator. Like that's something that we're able to brag about. So, you know, it's, I've, I've never had any publication drama or any, you know, why'd you write this here? You could have done this for us. Like yeah. everyone's been really, really supportive. Okay. Yeah, that's dope that you have that support. Now, I think you've been super helpful for artists and writers up to this point. But just to end it off, I got to get your opinion on a few things that are just more pop culture. Like, number sure. one, you mentioned Everyday Struggle, Joe Budden, and the publications you listen to. Now, tell me what you felt when Joe Budden left Everyday Struggle. I know you watched it beforehand. It sounds like you, you've you been a fan for a minute. And how do you feel about the current state of everyday struggle? It, uh, I, I was worried for them. I was very worried for them. Joe was obviously the star of the show. And academics is both a really strong platform for him. Like, I, I don't want to put him down because he's a he's a troll. But, like, he's, he's really built a strong following. And, you know, at the time, I didn't think the show would be able to last without Joe. Uh, they, 
that they, that they brought Star on. Uh, he's like a legendary radio host. He was there for a little bit. And then they had the current uh, host, Wayno. He would special guest alongside Star for a while. And then Wayno became the, uh, the new, like, permanent host. And Star isn't there anymore. And uh, Wayno has kind of assumed Joe's role, but he's not as extravagant and crazy as Joe. Yeah. Like, like Wayno and academics definitely get into some pretty heated debates, but it's never to the extent where Joe would be like screaming at the top of his lungs, standing up, ripping off his mic. Like he, he, he would be crazy. I, I, I still like the show. Like I, I, I think the show is the fact that it's lasted this long without Joe is impressive to me. I think Wayno is a big part of that because mm-hmm. he, he's an older hip hop head. You know, he's, he's managed artists, um, he was involved with Def Jam, I believe. He, he he's done a lot, and and you know, academics caters more towards the teenagers and the and the people in the low twenties. And Wayno is like people who are you know in the in the later twenties and then you know the thirties. So there's, there's a diversity of uh, of opinion there, and it's kind of a show that like anyone can watch. And, and they get into really heated debates, and they both take very strong stances. So. Like I, you know, sometimes, sometimes I even agree with academics. I'm like, mm, Wayno's like an old head. He's looking at this a certain way. Sometimes I agree with Wayno. So it gives you the opportunity to really, you know, connect with both of them. And I feel connected to the show as a journalist because I'm, I'm writing about a lot of these things that they talk about, or I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm paying attention to them. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's still solid. Um, I would say Joe Budden podcast is my favorite uh, out of uh, Rap Radar and Everyday Struggle. But I, I'm, I make sure to tune in to Everyday Struggle on most days. So I'm, I'm not going to sit here and talk down on it. <laughs> <laughs> Got you. What about the whole Kanye scenario? Everything that's going on with Kanye. Let me hear your Man. thoughts there. That is one of the most interesting things. You know, Kanye has always been a very unique individual, very arrogant, very in his head, the the things that he says and does, he thinks are right. I think he has, some of his intentions are good. Some of them. He doesn't doesn't communicate it well. He doesn't doesn't align himself with people who- You gotta stop giving him that, that, that cop out. He hasn't communicated well. Kanye is a very well spoken speaker. Very true. Very I've true. heard many interviews with him. He, the guy speaks very well. Been watching him for years, and, and he's. A, I mean, he's a lyr- He writes well as well when yeah. he wants to. So, yeah. why do people always use that as a cop out? I think he's he's branded that that cop mm-hmm. out. I don't speak well, and I'm never strategy. I'm just expressing myself. Like what? What? What, yeah. what is it really with Kanye? other than the tensions. I understand he has, when someone challenges him, he can be brash, and that part gets a little weird, but I think he's so much more strategic than people give him credit for, because he's oh, he is. I'm not a strategist. He is. All of this is marketing. Like, like it's, it's really interesting to me how people are in such an uproar about everything he's doing. Like, when it comes to when, Al- when Kanye is about to release a new shoe or an album, that's when he gets on Twitter. That's when he starts saying all this crazy stuff. Like it, exactly. it's very obviously marketing, and and you're right. He's he he is he is a well spoken person. What I should have said rather is that he doesn't think about the, the the impact of the things that he says on on his fans or people who used to support him. Like people who followed him from the college dropout days when when he was on TV and he said George Bush don't care about black people. Like people who were fans from then and seeing how he is now wearing the the, the MAGA hat and going to, to, to chill with Trump and all this and saying, you know, uh, abolish this and this and that, you know, people who have followed him all that time and feel that personal connection to him, I completely understand why they feel betrayed. But, you know, people have to recognize music is a business and, and marketing and branding comes in so many different ways. Like this, this Nikki and Cardi beef, that gave uh, Nikki the opportunity to then put out the, the, this video that she had with Tyga and it's doing pretty well. And it's probably gonna be a, uh, a, a top five on Billboard at some point, if not top 10. So, you know, at people, and I, I don't necessarily judge people for that because a lot of people don't understand the ins, the ins and outs of, 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 of the music business. Like why certain artists don't work together or why certain artists do work together even if they don't necessarily like each other. Like people are looking to maximize how much money they can get. Because okay. Kanye, despite everything he was doing, uh, his album he dropped did very, very well its first week. 
it did very well. And, and, and he, 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 he likely is going to make a bunch of money off it if he ever, you know, tours. But, you know, with that, he also had the other albums that came out, uh, Yeezus, Yeezy, whatever, put out new clothes. So, like, it, it, it all connected together, and it just maximized his opportunity to make money. And that's really what it's all about for a lot of but these what's people. What's so interesting about this time, this isn't a period where you could just say, all right, it's music, it's music, it's business, it's business. I think where a lot of uproar is coming from is so many people feel like the, what you're doing now within politics, that's beyond music. Like now you're talking about things that really affect livelihood or making decisions that reflect livelihood and how the media can manipulate and use you as a pawn for real legislation that gets gets in play or building supporter in certain communities for you know whatever political campaign. That's the difference between all the mess he said before or a lot of things he threw out there before versus now. So yeah. what do you, do you feel like is, is, is any more dangerous than the things he's done before or to you is it all just, I mean, it's Kanye being Kanye. No, it, it, it's, it's, it definitely can get dangerous if he has any influence on politicians. I mean, we, we all know his relationship with Trump, but I don't know how much Trump actually is listening to him and you know like acting on on the things kanye wants to do oh, yeah. you know you know if kanye were to become president i doubt people would elect well i don't know i mean anything at trump got elected and i, I didn't think that would happen so <laughs> yeah. kanye runs 2020 lord knows but he doesn't necessarily have any true political power like he, he can tweet something he can go hang with trump he can say all these ideas to trump but my perception of their whole relationship like i feel like trump looks at him like you know, the, the, this guy advocates for me. He says that I'm a great guy, so I'm going to keep him close, but I don't really actually care for him. Like, I, I, I don't really care for, you know, his music. I don't care for, for what he wants to do. Like, this is just someone who I can align myself with who's going to continue to get me headlines and, and present me in a positive light. I don't think Kanye is going to convince black people to like Trump, but I, I think Trump looks at it as an opportunity to get at least a couple more people on, on his side. That's that's how I see Trump more so. I don't really think he's super invested in necessarily what Kanye um, is trying to get done, if Kanye is really trying to get anything positive done. I know he's speaking a lot of that stuff, but I don't know the full intentions behind what Kanye is doing. But yeah. I feel like any likelihood for Trump to take any of the advice of Kanye as far as this, doing this in the community, creating Kanye innovation centers and school programs and all that stuff, might be because of great timing in terms of I'm trying to get reelected and I can show that I'm actually acting on this stuff. But at the same, but at the same time, he is using Kanye in terms of saying, hey, this is a symbol of my support within the black community, mm -hmm. right? There they, are black people. Look, this is the biggest black star in the world. And you know, the way Trump will talk, he's the biggest, biggest, ever there's never been a black star he's bigger than obama that's what, like that's the kind of stuff trouble will say and say like and he's supporting me this shows that i'm in the right right you know like that's that's the more interesting part and and could be a little bit more dangerous i don't want to get too deep into the to to what those implications could be but when you talk about kanye moving uh strategically there is a chance that he might do something like this and actually run for president. Oh, but absolutely. That, that's what makes this positioning make more sense, right? Just yeah. him getting in there, seeing what the heat feels like and trying to understand that whole political thing. But okay, I I just wanted to get your service uh, opinion on that. I'm actually gonna do a video on Kanye and Trump. Well, I actually did it, but it'll probably drop like next week or something like that because I'm making some final tweaks. But you should check it out. I think I'll send it to you when I when I drop it. I'll like get your opinion on it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I th I think one thing people also don't recognize like Kanye needs help. Like he yeah. you know he 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 was on the opioids. You know after his mom died, he he really just wasn't the same. Like I I I don't know if he's actually sought out therapy. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know if he recognizes that that's something that could benefit him. And this is not me justifying or excusing anything that he said or done that's affected people. But I think people like him, people like R. Kelly, like I, I think like they have illnesses in their minds, like like the way that they think, the way that they think saying certain things or doing certain things. Is OK, like they definitely need help. And people are so quick to just cancel people 
and canceling them like it doesn't fix the problem within them and if people don't care to help Kanye like that's fine but I think there needs to be some kind of recognition that he, he definitely needs help as well as well as to just like chill with this Trump stuff and everything like he needs some form of help mentally yeah I mean I think that's an interesting perspective because I don't know there are people black people who have supported Trump but you wouldn't necessarily say that they're ill or in any way you just say man you suck or you're a sellout or you just aren't like all right that's your beliefs I don't get it but some people have made the observation or said that you know Kanye could be ill I don't really like to um diagnose people from afar or necessarily go with some of the what the media might say about them but if it is true definitely wish him the best on that tip but dope man I really appreciate your time my mind man and might have to do this again sometime because I, I think you bring a lot of dope perspective on just issues I would like to just talk about issues and get your opinion on issues um that are out in pop culture sometimes but no man, I really appreciate this opportunity I'm always impressed by YouTube creators and you know their ability to build platforms it's something I've been interested in myself um, so we can definitely have a conversation on the side just about, you know, your experiences with that, how you built up this following that you have. Um, and, you know, just just your your commitment to putting out content for people and giving them the opportunity to hear from someone like me. It, it's it, I'm sure it means a lot to a lot of your followers. So thank you. Thank you on behalf of me and on, on behalf of everyone who ends up watching this. That bet, man. Hey, I appreciate that. And once again, hey, you guys can follow Armand. He actually gave you guys is instagram i'm surprised i wouldn't if i was a writer i don't want people bugging me all the time but he did uh if you want to repeat it again you can go ahead and do that yeah so my instagram is just my name armand sadler uh a-r-m-o-n-s-a-d-l-e-r -E no underscores no numbers no spaces just just my name Bam. and my twitter, my twitter is uh at armizzle a-r-m-i-z-z-l-e and then there's an underscore at the end cool well, there it is, you guys. Once again, as always, if you like this video, go ahead and hit that like button. If you like it, you might as well share it. And if you're not subscribed, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button.